So two big questions today. Two very big, huge questions today. Number one, who is, who is, let me say it this way, who or what is the Antichrist that is predicted to come in the Bible? There are at least 116, you heard me right, 116 biblical traits, characteristics, qualifications, and descriptions of the one they call Antichrist, beast, and or false prophet, whose number is 666. And we're going to identify them. We're going to study them. And the second question, what are the signs of the second coming of Jesus Christ? Some people call it the rapture. Some people call it the second coming. The word rapture is not in the Bible, but the concept is. It's not a question of will there be a catching away, but when. When will it occur? What is the timing of it? And when will Jesus come back? Now, we don't know the day or the hour. We know that. Hold your comments about not knowing the day or the hour, but we know the general time. We know the season. We know the generation. So we are going to go into the Word of God. We are going to take today a deep dive, a deep dive into the Word of God. And we are going in this series, it's going to be going on for an undetermined, indeterminate period of time. We are going to look at every major relevant biblical passage on the subject of end time prophecy. Now that's a mouthful, but that's where we're going. And I want you to hook up with me and, and, and join me in this journey. It's exciting. Hallelujah. So we're going to be studying last things, the end times. It is uh, an area of theology known as eschatology. Eschatology. I am many things. I'm an evangelist, but also an eschatologist. That means that I have dedicated my life to studying the end time scripture. Paul said, not a novice. Amen. Well, I'm not a novice. I have been studying the word of God on the subject of end time last days prophecy since March of 1983, when I was 16 years old. So those are our two questions that we're going to look at. I don't normally preach or teach in a chair. This is like being in jail. <laughs> Those of you that know me and follow me know that I'm out of my element. This is very basic, very minimalistic, very um, <laughs> elementary what we're doing today. I've sort of got the chains on me. But, but the reason I'm doing this is that the Lord has led me now that we have over 50,000 followers on TikTok, we got thousands on other platforms and forums that follow me, but especially on TikTok, we have over 50,000 followers. You know, it, it's one thing to cast the line and catch the fish and reel him in. I'm an evangelist. Jesus said, be fishers of men. Amen. That's what I do. But you know, once that fish is caught, that fish has got to be cleaned. Amen. That fish has got to be cleaned. And so the Lord has led me to slow down, to temporarily, and I did say temporarily, stop the yelling and the shouting and the screaming and the turning flips and the holy rolling, <laughs> and calm down and teach by precept and by example, line upon line, precept upon precept. I stand in several ministry gifts. Most of y'all know me as Evangelist Mike Dial. And that's what I've been doing since the day I was saved. I started preaching the week I got saved. And I haven't stopped. It. But, but I also function in the office of teacher. Uh, Ephesians 4 says God has set in the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now we call this the five-fold ministry. And you can serve in uh, more than one office. And so many times you hear me loud and calling sinners to repentance and, and preaching the message of the cross. But sometimes I shift down. I downshift and I slow down 
and I teach. Glory to God. And I have an anointing in both areas. And so I want you to hook up. I want you to listen. I want you to get your Bible, if you have it, and turn with me today to the book of Daniel. We're going to be looking both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament about those two subjects, the return of Jesus Christ and the rise or the revealing of Antichrist. Now, it's not about Antichrist. It's about Jesus Christ. Amen. We're to, we're to look and pray, even so, come Lord Jesus. Praise God. But the rise of the Antichrist means one thing. This war going on in the Ukraine means one thing, and it means that Jesus is coming. And that's what the headlines are telling us. And so we're going to study the signs of the times, and we're going to do it from the Bible. So when we ask who or what is Antichrist, I am not going to be giving you my opinions. Because my opinions, my ideas, my theories, my theses are useless. You don't want them, and they're not worth anything. But what this Bible says is everything. So I am going to give you, if you want to put a title on this, the 116 traits and characteristics, descriptions and qualifications of Antichrist, Beast, False Prophet, 666. But the key is biblical, scriptural. I'm not going to tell you what some Yahoo is speculating. I am not going to sit here and look at this camera and give you conspiracy theories. Amen. You don't need to hear conspiracy theories. Are you listening to me? When you follow Evangelist Mike Dial, I do not give you fables or fairy tales or fiction or fantasy. No, I don't give you conspiracy theories. I give you the cross, hallelujah, and truth. And so all you're going to hear is the Word of God. And we're not going to be adding to the Word, and we're not going to be subtracting from the Word. Because Revelation 22 says if you add to the Word, then the plagues written about in the Word are going to be added to you. You don't want, to, you don't want that. If you take away from the Word, Revelation 22 says, God will take your name out of the Lamb's Book of Life. So we need to be sticklers to the Word. Why? Because Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 16, he said, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It's God-breathed, and it's profitable. For what? For reproof, for instruction, for correction, in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect and thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's the purpose of the Bible. And Paul told Timothy, study to show yourself approved. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word. Well, folks, today, there's a lot of people wrongly dividing the word. Oh, they teach, they preach, but they're not properly dividing the word. They don't understand the science of hermeneutics, the, the study, the science of scriptural interpretation. So their homiletics, their preaching is wrong. They're messed up. Well, we're going to rightly divide the word. And God gives us principles whereby we can do that. Amen. So, so that's what we're going to do. Jesus said in the Great Commission, he said, Go make disciples of all the nations. I know one translation in Mark says, Preach the gospel to everybody. And that's correct, the gospel of the kingdom. But you look at it in the Greek, and it says, Make disciples of all the nations. So I want to teach you. I want to train you. I don't just want to get you saved and make you a baby Christian, I want to clean you up and grow you into a mature believer, not just with the milk, but with the meat of the Word. Hallelujah. And, and what we're going to talk about today, it's, it's the meat of the Word. Amen. And it's exciting. It, I, I promise you one thing about this series, you will not be bored because you're hearing everything on Fox and CNN and NBC and on, on the apps and the sites about all this, but are they really explaining it? They can tell you what's happening, but only God and his word can tell you what's really going on. Amen. So let's get into this today, starting in Daniel chapter 7, and I want you to look with me at the 8th verse. 
Daniel was a man who could read the handwriting on the wall. Amen. Daniel was a man who could interpret the dreams. And that's what he did. And that's what a true prophet of God does. He understands things. God reveals things. He has visions and dreams. He understands things that other people can't do. He can, he can break clues and solve mysteries and solve riddles. And the Bible gives us a lot of code, riddles, and mysteries about the last days of the end times, about the coming of Christ, about particularly the rise of the Antichrist. So let's start in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 8. I considered the horns. Now, the word horn in the Bible is symbolic of authority, power, or dominion. I consider the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. Now, he's talking about the Antichrist, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in his horn were eyes like the eyes of a man. Eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth, a big mouth, speaking great things. Now, the Bible scholars, the Hebrew scholars, tell us that when it says a mouth speaking great things, it could also be translated pompous words. Pompous words. So here in this verse, we see the first trait and characteristic of the Antichrist. He is a man. He is a human being, a person. He is real flesh and blood. He won't be a machine, an idea, a system, a religion, a computer program, a nation, or anything along that. He'll be a real flesh and blood human being. And in this verse, we also see the second trait. He is a powerful Person. That's what the word horn means. Now, <laughs> a little bit of humor as we began, it, it could also be a hint. I think personally it is, and I don't want to offend some of y'all with this, but I like straight talk. I like to be direct. He's a very horny person. <laughs> he, he doesn't understand the horns of the altar and praying through, but he's horny and he chases women, and he's a womanizer. That uh, Many other scriptures are going to bear out the fact that he is a fornicator. I'm not joking around here. He is a fornicator. That's one of the, uh, the traits that we're going to come to. So here we see that he's, he's a powerful man. He is a horny man. And chapter 8, verse 24 uh, brings that out. Now, look, every scripture reference that I give you in this teaching series, I'm not going to open the Bible and, and, and turn to it and read it directly. A lot of these, because we'd be preaching until Jesus comes on that subject if we did. So a lot of the scripture references, what I'm going to do, <laughs> I'm going to play Professor Mike. I'm going to play Dr. Mike, Professor Mike. Amen. Your college uh, professor. And I'm going to give you homework. Amen. And I'm going to make this interactive. This is not me sitting here lecturing you like, like Professor Mike in a lecture hall. No, I want, I want this to be interesting. I want this to be interactive. I want you to participate. I want you to send in your questions to my comment page. And myself and my uncle at Daryl Dial Zero on TikTok will get to your questions. I want you to send in your comments. I want you to send and share, hit that share button and, and send this and all my messages to your friends, to your social media. Share with others because you care. It's only fair. I want you to be involved. I want you to be intrinsically involved with what we're saying. So look up and write down, take notes, all of the scripture references. This is school of the Bible, folks. A lot of y'all go to high school, you go to college, you go to grad school, but when you listen to Evangelist Mike Dial, you're in school of the Bible. School of the Bible. School of spiritual warfare. School of the Bible. Praise God. School of the Bible. And I'm happy to be Professor Mike. I want to set out proper systematic theology. Amen. You don't need another computer system. You don't need another computer screen. Amen. You don't need another school. What you need is proper systematic theology. Amen. 
proper systematic theology because these screens, they're not going to save you. These screens are not going to save you. The information and the knowledge. I said the information and the knowledge, the data, the analytics on these screens is not going to save you. Daniel prophesied in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4 that in the last days men will go to and fro. That's the transportation revolution. But also that knowledge shall be increased. But it's not necessarily godly knowledge or the knowledge of God. It's the knowledge of it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil spoken of in the book of Genesis. Look, true knowledge, true knowledge, the Bible says, is to fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. A lot of people are afraid today. They think we're going to be nuked. They think we're going to have global thermonuclear war. And they run around in a spirit of fear controls their life because all they do is watch the media. You need to forget about the media and find Jesus Christ, the mediator, hallelujah, between God and man. And you need to fear only God because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. And when you fear God, he'll give you peace. He'll give you joy. Even in the midst of a storm, even in the midst of World War III, even all the way to Armageddon. Folks, I'm going to be teaching you in this series about the apostasy that's happening all around us, approaching Armageddon, apocalypse, the rise of the Antichrist, and the announcing of the coming of Jesus Christ. Praise God, hallelujah. Four, five A words. This is what we're talking about. But even in the midst of all of this, with billions dying all around us, with seven last plagues coming, with the God variant coming, and, and billions are going to die, with the plagues and bowls and trumpets of this Bible, if you have Jesus Christ in your heart, you, you can have a smile on your face and joy in your heart. Hallelujah. And a leap in your step and dance in the Holy Ghost. Why? Because you know God has got the whole world in in his hands. Hallelujah. God has got it in control. How many of you know this is called the scriptures? We'll look at the first part of that word, script. S-C-R-I-P-T, script. God has a script. God has his plan. And God is Alpha and God is Omega. And God is bigger than Alphabet Google. And God is bigger than Gog and Magog. He has a plan. And we are living in in the last days, and everything that was prophesied to happen is going to happen now. And we are so privileged and so blessed to be living in such a time, in such a time as this. Now, our third clue as to the characteristics and the trait of the Antichrist is found right here at the end of verse 8. It says that he has a mouth speaking great things, pompous, arrogant things. This, this speaking great things or this boasting, which is a huge characteristic of the beast, is also found down in verse 11. It is found in verse 20. It is found in verse 25. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when the Bible says something once, you better click your heels together. Salute the commander-in-chief and hear what the word of the Lord says. And a lot of y'all, the reason you can't hear God is because you got the electronic noise which drowns out the still small voice of God. You have the earbuds in your ear, buds, and you can't hear God. Amen. You can't see what God is doing in the spirit because all you see are screens. All you see is our screens from Apple and, and, and Samsung and so on and so forth. And you look for, and you lust after things. You want another delivery from Amazon. But you see, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We walk by faith and not by sight. You need to stop, get, get away from the visual, virtual, video realm, amen, the scene realm, and get into the realm of hearing and reading the word of God because that's how faith comes. Amen. Amen. You better zoom in on Jesus and get off the Zoom app. Are you listening to me now? Now, but when it repeats something over and over and over again, as in the case of a mouth speaking great things, well, you need to pay attention. God's not just talking to hear himself talk. Amen. God's not just talking for the sake of his health. 
He's in perfect health. Hallelujah. He hadn't died and fallen off the throne. No, he's talking to get your attention. But the, the, the problem that I have in, 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 in teaching the Word of God is that I'm dealing with people's attention spans, and I don't mean to insult you, but, but attention spans are, 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 are small. They're tiny. They're short. People want to multitask. People can't focus. They, they have short attention spans. Well, God wants you to expand, to expand, to expand your attention span, to broaden your mind and to open your mind and to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Seven times in the book of the Revelation, it said, Jesus said, that we need to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. God is talking, but His voice is being blocked by your electronics, and your electronics is ghost in the Holy Ghost because he can't get through. God is a gentleman. He speaks softly. He won't force himself on you. God's not a rapist. God's not an assaulter. You come willingly. You come by choice. Amen. Hallelujah. God's, God's, God's army, it's an all-volunteer army. Amen. So, so the third clue here is his mouth speaks great things. And as we go through this teaching... Over the next few days, weeks, however long we're in this, I want you to notice how many times the word great is used in many different ways to describe the Antichrist, beast, false prophet. God is giving you hints. God is giving you clues. God is chipping away at the mystery of lawlessness, at the mystery of iniquity. And God is giving us a bigger and bigger picture of exactly who he will be. Now, I want you to go down to verse 11. Go down to verse 11. I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. The, the fourth trait, characteristic, description, qualification of the Antichrist is that he eventually burns in hell forever. <laughs> Amen. With the devil. Praise God. He eventually is going to meet his Waterloo at the Battle of Armageddon in Israel. When Zechariah says Jerusalem will be made a cup of trembling for all the nations. It's all about Israel. This thing is not about just the Ukraine. Believe me, this is just the first battle of the Third World War or the Battle of Armageddon. The Battle of Armageddon, the Third World War, will culminate and end in the nation, in the land of Israel. And it is all, and really only, about Israel. So don't panic. We're not going to get nuked today. Things have got to happen. The two witnesses have got to come. The Antichrist has to be totally revealed. There has to be seals and bowls and trumpet judgments. All these things have yet to happen. We're on the cusp of it. But we're years away from the end of Armageddon. Amen. So it's not going to happen today. Don't think, look out, you're going to have a nuclear bomb. You're going to be... Nu no, 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 no. Get over that spirit of fear. That's the devil trying to destroy you and hold you back. But the Holy Ghost wants you to know that eventually... The Antichrist is going to be cast into the lake of fire and the one who speaks the great words is going to burn forever. Now I want you to go down to the 20th verse. And you ought to read the whole chapter because context matters. Don't take a scripture, a verse, one verse, out of its context and make a pretext because that's how cults start and that leads to the occult. So for your homework assignment, read the entire 7th chapter of Daniel. But for the sake of time, right now, I'm just hitting the highlights. I'm just giving you the pole, the rod, so you can go fish. Amen. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just giving you the shovel so you can dig. The 20th verse of Daniel 7. And of the ten horns that were in his head. Horns represent power and authority. They represent nations and, and kingdoms. And of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes, we told you about, and a mouth, a mouth, he talks, he texts, he, tweet, he tweets, he types, he transmits, 
very great things. He's always talking about great things. There's our word great again. And here's the, here's the next clue. Whose look or whose appearance was more stout, more stout or greater, more stout than his fellows. Look, it doesn't matter who you think the Antichrist is or who your pastor, mega church pastor, or favorite media church pastor thinks or theorizes the Antichrist is. What matters is, again, and I, and I, had, I have to emphasize this, what does the Bible say about the Antichrist? What does the Bible say about the Antichrist? And a huge, massive and that's a pun on words, that's a play on words, <laughs> huge, massive clue is given in verse 20. At the end of the verse, it says his look, or his appearance, his looks, what does he look like? What's the Antichrist going to look like? Well, here you go. Whose look was more stout than his fellows. <laughs> Whose look was more stout than his fellows. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means he will be a heavy set, big, rotund, one could say fat man. That's just what the Bible says. I didn't make this up. He is a big man who talks about big things and who does big things. He's not a little guy, he's not a thin guy, he's not a small guy. He's not a small-time guy. He's not somebody you've never heard of. He's not some leader of some obscure nation. He doesn't have an appearance that is against what the Bible says. He looks exactly like the Bible said he would look, and the Bible says his look was more stout than his fellows. Now, folks, as we begin this series, I just want you to understand how amazing it is that a man who lived hundreds of years before Jesus and thousands of years before us could look with the eye of the Spirit and look into the future and call the exact world conditions of 2022 many, 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 many years ago. That is just amazing. That's astounding. But that's how the Spirit of God works. As a matter of fact, the New Testament says that these prophets, they weren't just talking to themselves and to their generation, but they were talking to us, and they were born along by the Holy Spirit. And that's how the Bible was written. I tell people all the time in my preaching, I didn't write the Bible, but I know the one who did. And what do I mean by that? I, I mean that, that I know Jesus. I have a personal relationship with Jesus, and the Holy Spirit lives in me. And, and what the Holy Spirit did is he, those, those writers of the Bible, those human writers that God used, they were born along and they were led by the Holy Spirit. So the actual author of the Bible, it's not humans. It's not humanity. It's, it's of divine authorship. That's why I call it the inspired, infallible, inerrant word of Almighty God. Hallelujah. And that's why if y'all see me preach all over America, you see me holding up my Bible to the crowd saying, you can pry this Bible from my cold, dead Bible thumping hands. And that's the reason that I'm such a word person. That's why I stand on the Word, because God gave His Word. It is the Word of God. It says here, Holy Bible. And why, why does it say Holy Bible? Because it's the, not the Word of man. Men didn't write the Bible. Men were used of God to write the Bible. It is not the Word of a man or a denomination or a religion. It is the Word of God. Amen. And this word of God gives these traits, qualifications, and characteristics of the Antichrist. And in that 25th verse, in verse 25, we see our next clue, our next trait. And he shall speak great, <laughs> great words again. You think the Holy Spirit the author of the Bible, the one who gives the mysteries, the mystery. The New Testament always talks about the mystery, the mystery, the mystery. You think the Holy Spirit's trying to tell you something? Here again, it says, 
Again, he shall speak great words, pompous words, great words against the Most High. He takes on God and shall wear out the saints, persecute the saints of the Most High. Think about this. Here's our next clue. He will speak against God. He will literally, I mean, GD, GD, BS, will flow out of his mouth and he'll persecute the church. He'll speak against God. The Antichrist, whoever he is, is a man with a foul mouth given to cursing and profanity. Amen. He's not going to be a choir boy. He's going to have a salty mouth. Hmm. The wheels are turning, aren't they? God gives clues. God wants you to know. God places no premium on, on ignorance. In, in, in 1 Corinthians 12, when, when, when the Holy Ghost is, 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 is describing spirituals, the gifts of the Spirit, Paul says, by the Holy Spirit, he says, I would not have you be ignorant, brethren. God places no premium on ignorance. God wants you to know the truth. Hallelujah. We're not in the dark ages where things are hidden. Glory to God. We're in the church age. And, and God, the Holy Spirit, has given you his spirit, his anointing, who will teach you and lead you in all things. And those who are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. Hallelujah. 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 In the same 25th verse, we keep on reading, and it says, He will wear out, he will wear out, or he'll persecute the saints of the Most High God. He will attack the true church. Now, he's going, it's going to bring out later, he's part of what's called the harlot, whore, apostate church. Amen. He deceives many people into thinking he's a Christian. That's why he's called Antichrist. He didn't come, we're, we're, going, we're going to find this out later, he didn't came, come in the name of Buddha or Muhammad or Hare Krishna or the Virgin Mary. No, he comes in the name of Jesus Christ. He claims to be Christ. He claims to be anointed. He claims to be the Messiah. So he'll be part of the, 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 the apostate harlot whore church, which is called the whore of Babylon in Revelation 18. But he will persecute the true church. He will persecute the true church of the saints of the Most High. But not only that, our, our next clue, clue number eight, says he will think to change times and laws. He will seek, think, attempt to change times and laws. Now, this is stunning. The Antichrist beast false prophet will be a change agent. He will be a reformer, one who tries to change times and laws. In other words, whoever he is, and by the way, the Bible identifies him as male. It keeps calling him he, the masculine, the male. So all you women can breathe a sigh of relief. You're not the Antichrist. <laughs> all you ladies can breathe a sigh of relief. You're not the beast. You're not the false prophet. You're not 666. Amen. So all the, the women, um, I guess that, 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 dismisses over half the world as being candidates to be in a crash. No, he will be a man. He will be a man, and, and this man will be a change agent. In other words, he won't accept the laws as written. He will seek to change and implement new laws. He won't accept the treaties and the borders as they are established in agreements. He will seek to change it. He won't like the way man and men and governments do things, he will seek to change it. We're going to talk more. Most of these clues are repeated, and we're going to talk about them uh, more and more. But for now, let's move on to Daniel chapter 8 and verse 9. Daniel chapter 8, verse 9. Actually, let's begin with verse 8 to get it in context. Therefore, the he-goat waxed very great. Now, the word great is used here and, and with purpose. This is talking about the kingdom of Grecia, the kingdom of Greece, and specifically about a man known, those of you that have studied history, by the name of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great basically conquered the known world by the time he was 28 years of, years of age. Now you think about that. 
Hitler did amazing exploits. Uh, Napoleon Bonaparte did amazing exploits, but no one has ever. None of the Caesars, not Nero, none of, not, not, none of those people have, have done by the age of 28 what this man did. Now, he didn't do it by himself. He did it by a powerful fallen angel that assisted him. And that same spirit is going to be re-released in the earth and that is the beast and is going to possess this human called the Antichrist. So we have the Antichrist, which is the human, and the beast, which is the mighty fallen angel, demon, devil, evil spirit, that possesses him and enables him to do this. So the he-goat waxed very great. But again, notice the word great. Again, notice the word great. For when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. Now, history teaches us that when Alexander's kingdom, uh, when he died, that his kingdom was broken up into four distinct segments. Amen. It is incredible that before there even was an Alexander, before Alexander the Great was even a twinkle in his daddy's eye, the Bible predicted not only his, his reign of terror and conquest and expansion, but also how his kingdom would break up and that it would break up into four segments. Again, when I got saved back in 1983, it was prophecies like this and, and dozens of others that convinced me that the Bible was the Word of God. Prophecy is tomorrow's news today. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Prophecy is tomorrow's news today. Prophecy tells you the end from the beginning. And, 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 and the Word says we have a more sure word of prophecy. Peter said we have a more sure word of prophecy. And that's why I can speak with such confidence, such boldness, and such assurance. Verse 9. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, a little horn which waxed, exceedingly great. Now, this little horn is a type of the Antichrist. Now, he's not literally a horn. This is, this is allegory. This is symbolism. You'll find in the prophetic teachings of the Word of God that allegory and symbolism are used all the time. I'll give you an example. Back in Genesis, it talks about the serpent, the serpent, the snake. It's a type of Satan, Lucifer. Now, the devil's not a snake. The devil's not a serpent. The devil's not ugly. He doesn't creep on the ground. He may, through occult power, be able to take the form of a serpent or present himself that way, but that's not what he is. Lucifer, the devil, he's never even been to hell. He doesn't have a pitchfork and horn and a, and a, <laughs> and a red suit. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. He's never even been to hell. You read the book of Job, he, he has access to heaven. Amen. So, But the Bible calls him a serpent because that's what he's like. That's the role he plays. So you have to understand when you study prophecy, you don't take everything exactly literal. Sometimes you do. The Bible is a work of literature, so you take it literally. But also as a work of literature, there is poems, there is prose, there's history, there's didactic teaching, there's symbolism, and there's allegory. There are types and shadows in the Bible. Amen. So he's a little horn which waxed exceedingly great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. So this is the second mention of the little horn. And again, we see a massive clue or a great clue that he is called a great man. And in the 10th verse, it waxed great even to the host of heaven. It waxed great again and again, over and over again, like a broken record, the word great is used about the Antichrist. Now, I'm going to ask all my followers and those who are watching who aren't following me to just read between the lines. Use your brain. God gave you a brain. Now use it. What is the Holy Ghost saying? What is the Holy Ghost warning us about? What is the Holy Ghost trying to prepare us? By constantly using that word great. By constantly using the word great. And then he goes on and he says, Yea, this is verse 11, He magnified himself, even to the prince of hosts. He magnified himself, even to the prince of hosts. 
and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Now this takes us to Matthew 24. This is your homework assignment. You say, Brother Mike, Professor Mike, you sure give a lot of homework. I do. Amen. You know why? You know why I give a lot of homework? Because God's final exam is coming. I said, God's final exam is coming. That's why I went to New York and I gave God's two-minute warning to this world. That's why I went to New York and I gave God's last call to the world. And thank God 610,000 of y'all viewed it. I give homework. I do what I do. I do what I do because God's final exam is coming. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourself to see whether you be in the faith. Pop quiz is coming. The greatest pop quiz of all time is coming. It's called the judgment seat of Christ, the great white throne. And you better be prepared. And let me just ask you, TikTok, are you ready for judgment day? Are you ready for judgment day? You better get ready. He magnified himself. This is taking us to Matthew 24, verse 15 to 28, where Jesus talks about something called the abomination of desolation. It's blasphemy. That's the Antichrist. That's the rise of the Antichrist, the revealing of the Antichrist. When he goes into the rebuilt Jewish temple in Jerusalem and proclaims himself to be God and wants you to worship him, that's called, and he builds a statue, an image of the beast, the mark of the beast, the name of the beast, the number of the beast. We're going to get to all that, so stay tuned. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you what the mark of the beast is, what the number of the beast, the name of the beast, and the number of the beast. I'm going to tell you all those things. Stay tuned. Stay with me. Jesus calls it the abomination of desolation. And the key to the abomination of desolation that we see here is that he magnifies himself. Now think of that. It's stunning. These scriptures, these descriptions and depictions of the Antichrist are stunning. They are staggering and they are shocking. What does he do? He magnifies himself. That's, that's characteristic number 10. He, he, he exalts himself. He, he exalts himself. We also read this down in verse 25. Same thing. Down in verse 25. He magnifies himself. He Right here in verse 25, he magnifies himself. We see it in chapter 11, verse 36 of Daniel. He magnifies himself. He's all about self. He's a very selfish man. He's a very arrogant man, a very vain man. Who does this remind you of? He's not humble in any way. He's brutish. He boasts all the time in his speaking. He's into positive thinking, positive confession, power of positive thinking, the power of positive thinking. And he surrounds himself by people who are about positive, and he doesn't think he can lose. He thinks he will always win. He will not admit failure. And if a setback comes, it's never his fault. It's always somebody else's fault as he blame shifts and, and blames others. He exalts himself. In other words, it's all about him. It's all about him. Now, in verse 11, he takes away the daily sacrifice. And basically, he tells the whole world, you got to worship me because I'm God. You're going to worship me because I'm God. He demands worship. That's clue number 11. He demands worship, and he makes it all about him. Now, foreshadowing in the New Testament, we're going to get to it eventually. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, we see that the Antichrist will demand to be worshipped, and he will outlaw all other religion except beast worship. Folks, we're going to go back and forward between the Old Testament and the New, but they are congruent. The Old Testament teaches the same thing about the Antichrist as the New. They are not at all in conflict. Verse 12 of Daniel chapter 8. And a host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. In other words, he outlaws all other religions, and he gives the ultimate mandate. I said the ultimate mandate 
and that is that he is the only one to be worshipped. Like Nebuchadnezzar in the days of Daniel. You will worship my statue, my image, and if you don't, I'm going to cast you down into a fiery furnace or a lion's den. And look at the result of it. This is an amazing phraseology. And it cast down the truth to the ground. It cast down the truth to the ground. That's what apostasy does. In 1 John, it says, how are you going to recognize the Antichrist? The Antichrist is the spirit of error. The spirit of the Lord is the spirit of truth. And the Antichrist has a wrong doctrine of Christ. The Antichrist doesn't believe Jesus came in the flesh, died in the flesh, and was risen in the flesh. He is a Gnostic. He is a Gnostic heretic. He is abomination. He is blasphemy, and he casts the truth down to the ground. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free, but the Antichrist will cast the truth down to the ground. Apostasy, departure from truth and faith will come, and you will find yourself in bondage. He casts the truth to the ground. Characteristic number 12, he's a liar who hates the truth and who casts down the truth to the ground. Now, he'll like certain preachers and teachers who tell him what he wants to hear. As a matter of fact, the New Testament says that in the last days, people will have doctrines of demons and they will heap to themselves teachers with itching ears. Itching ears. You get it? Itching ears. Itching ears. Tell you what you want to hear. I don't tell you what you want to hear. I tell you what you need to hear. But he tells people through flattery what they want to hear. And notice it goes on and it says, and it practiced. And it practiced. And it practiced. And it practiced. The next characteristic, he is surrounded by those who practice witchcraft and the occult. Chapter 8, verse 24, further brings this out. He surrounds himself with spiritual people, just like Nebuchadnezzar and the kings of Babylon surrounded themselves with spiritual advisors. Spiritual advisors. But they aren't true prophets. They are false prophets and diviners who practice divination. They are not true spokesmen for God, like I am. Instead, they are sorcerers, and they are shamans, and they are soothsayers. They're not warriors for God like I am. They are wizards, and they are warlocks, and they will claim to know Christ, but the Christ they know is another spirit, another Jesus. The gospel they know is another God. Practice, and not only practice, look at the next word, and prospered and prospered. Clue number 14, he is a man of great prosperity, and chapter 8, 24 brings that out a lot. The gospel of prosperity is the dominant doctrine in 21st century and late, latter 20th century Christianity. As a matter of fact, the last church of the church age mentioned in Revelation, in Revelation 3 and 20, her constant confession her positive confession is, I am rich. Who does that remind you of? What TV preacher does that remind you of? I can name about a hundred of them. I'm rich. I'm increased with goods. I have need of nothing. And that's how they see themselves. Their positive self-esteem, their positive confession, their positive thinking, their prosperity gospel, their purpose gospel, their psychology message, their politics. But Jesus says, Things are not as they seem. You may see yourself that way, but Jesus turns around and says, but really, you are poor, miserable, wretched, blind, and naked. And then it says, he knocks on the door. He's pictured as being outside his own church. He calls them lukewarm. And that's Laodicea. And all they want to do is lay up treasures and get laid. That's what Laodicea does. Lay up pleasures and get laid. So prosperity. The, the, the Antichrist is a part of the prosperity gospel. And he is their star. He is the one they worship and they look to and they cast their lot with. The Antichrist, ladies and gentlemen, over and over it says he's a man of great wealth, 
great privilege, great abundance, and great prosperity. No poor man, no middle class man, no millionaire can be Antichrist. The only person who can biblically play the role of the Antichrist is a multi-billionaire. Amen. Now, this is what the Bible teaches. I want you to go to verse 13. And then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto the certain saint that which, How long shall the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said to me, Under 2,300 days, and then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. The next qualification, clue, characteristic trait of the Antichrist, he is a man of transgression, of abomination, of desolation, and of indignation in the last days, in the latter time. For further support of that, you can go to Matthew 24, 15, as I just said, to Daniel eleven thirty one to chapter 8, verse 19, and to chapter 9, verse 27. These words describe him. These words describe him. And I want you to go down to verse 23. And in the latter time of their kingdom. Now here, Daniel says, I'm not talking to Israel or Babylon or the people of my day. I'm, I, and that's what a seer, a prophet does. He looks perhaps centuries, millennia into the future, and he leaps to the last days. He leaps to the last days in the latter time of their kingdom when the transgressors are come to the full. In other words, when the iniquity is full. The Bible speaks when the, the cup of the Amorites were full. That's when God's judgment comes. When the, when the transgressors are come to the full, and now, now here's our next clue. And this is a biggie. Oh boy, this is a biggie. A king of fierce countenance. Now stop, hold the presses. A king of fierce countenance. This is fierce countenance. Not much of a smile. Not really happy. Always brooding, always dark, always intense, always angry, always with a scowl and a frown. The Bible not only describes the spiritual, mental characteristic of Antichrist, but also the very physical, it already said a moment ago, he's going to be stout. But now, not only stout, but it says he will be a king of fierce countenance. What does that mean? A king of fierce countenance. Well, it means exactly what it said. He is a king of fierce con uh, countenance. His scowl, his, his frown. It describes his physical traits, his physical attributes, and his physical looks. Now, who... Who now, in 2022, does that describe? The, the Antichrist, whoever he is, is not a nice guy. He's not a good guy. He's not a sweet guy. He's a bully. He's mean. He cuts people down. He insults. He calls names. He's fierce, a fierce Countenance, and it doesn't stop there. It goes on to our next clue and understanding dark sentences or riddles. Understanding dark sentences shall stand up. Dark sentences. Dark sentences. Well, what that means, it's, it's taking you, the language is taking you to the area of cults, but to the occult to witchcraft, to shamanism, to seances, to divination, to sorcery, to magic, and to witch doctrine. Now, people won't see it that way at first. People 
they, they're not going to see it that way at first. Because the greatest witches, listen to me, the greatest witches, the greatest warlocks come with the word of God in their hand. The greatest sorcerers, shamans, soothsayers, come with the scriptures in their hand. The diviners come talking about the divine one. And they come, Jesus said in, in, in the Olivet Discourse, and for those of y'all that are, that are beginners, Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13 are considered by scholars to be what's called the Olivet Discourse. And the Olivet Discourse, when he said wars and rumors of wars, nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom, earthquakes in diverse places, pestilences, all that predicting World War One, Two, and Three, predicting the coronavirus, COVID, earthquakes, great storms like Katrina. But he says in the midst of that, he said, many, not few, many will come in my name saying, I am Christ. Or in other words, I'm anointed. The Antichrist is going to come in the name of Jesus Christ, claiming to be anointed and claiming to be the anointed of God. And he will deceive many. Jesus said, if it were possible, he would even deceive the very elect, the, the so-called church, the churches, the denominations, the evangelical, Pentecostal, charismatic, word of faith, purpose-driven, grace revolution, G12 churches, emerging church, Baptist church. They will follow this man and they will believe he's of God because he's surrounded by these people, these famous preachers of the evangelical world who claim to be prophets. <laughs> but if you look below the surface and you look at what these people in the gospel of prosperity are actually preaching and teaching, <laughs> you realize they're not people of God. They're not even saved. They're sorcerers. They're shamans. They're diviners. They're witchcraft. They don't believe that Jesus came in the flesh. They're Gnostics. They don't believe that his physical flesh and blood, bodily death on the cross is where we were redeemed. They believe he had to go to hell, burn in hell. I, I'm serious. Be united with the devil, be, be tormented by demons and devils and evil spirits, and then just be born again. And, and the biggest preachers in the world preach and believe that nonsense. That's what they teach and believe. And these people are the ones that the Antichrist surrounds himself with to deflect the attention and to deceive. Jesus said these false prophets and false Christ will show, show through TV shows, through visual, virtual, video technology shall show lying signs, wonders, and miracles. They will deceive. And God, Thessalonians says, will send strong delusion that they should be alive. That's what he's talking about, understanding dark sentences. The Bible says that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, and the apostles do the same thing. They make you believe they're of Jesus Christ, but they're of Antichrist. Whew. This is heavy, isn't it? This is heavy, isn't it? This is heavy. We're going to stop for now. We're going to stop for now. We're going to pick up with part two next time. I love you. Thank you for being with me today. Stay tuned. This is Evangelist Mike Dial telling you, Jesus is still your answer, and Jesus is coming soon. Amen and amen.